Okay, before we move on to, uh, to different um, applications, and, and in particular when we move away from these, uh, these finite dimensional quantum systems, let me take um, some time to talk about the modeling and the approx approximations that are used in quantum mechanical systems. So whenever um, you encounter a problem that, uh, that should be solved with quantum mechanics, the first step and the important step that you'll have to consider first is um, to choose a space of states. So um, the first postulate says that you know, we can represent physical states um, in, in a Hilbert space, in a vector space of states. Um, but the question is which Hilbert space to use. Uh, inherently, we'll have to model our system by reducing the full space of states. So, I mean, the full space of states is, is the full space, the Hilbert space corresponding with the entire universe. Um, of course, we want to consider just um, the system that we're interested in. So we'll ignore interactions with external systems. We'll go to, um, for example, a small number of, um, of accessible energy levels. So if, uh, if the system starts off in, let's say, a thermal distribution, and there's, there's uh, two low-lying energy levels, but then um, there's a couple of higher-lying um, energy levels. Even though those higher energy levels may be present, it may not be necessary to include them in, um, in the description of a system. So this is, of course, the same kind of modeling step that you would encounter in, um, in uh, 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 classical mechanics and the solving of, of problems there. Another thing that we'll need to do, or that we'll often, often do, is decoupling some of the degrees of freedom from other degrees of freedom. In particular, um, for example, in the stern gerlach discussion, what we did is we decoupled the spin degrees of freedom as a quantum system from the spatial degrees of freedom as a quantum system. And we actually treated the spatial degrees of freedom, in particular the explicit separation of, um, of the spins uh, pointing in one direction and the other direction, we treated that as a classical um, separation, which you know, in some sense we should have treated that as a quantum system as well. Um, so that's one way in which we've separated the spin degrees of freedom from the spatial degrees of freedom. And then there's other steps as well. Um, so we've treated the fields in the stern gerlach discussion as classical fields. If we really want to describe a quantum system, um, we would have to include uh, um, quantum electrodynamics and, and we wouldn't be able to describe this based on, uh, on just classical electrodynamics. Um, if we're working with, uh, with particles that are, um, are, are ultra relativistic, then um, we may need to move to uh, a discussion that includes the relativistic effects as well. So we look at the, at the system and we model it and we reduce our space of states to something that is manageable. And uh, that's where these finite dimensional systems really um, can simplify things a lot. Uh, so we don't have to deal with continuous systems. We don't have to deal with um, infinite numbers of, uh, of, of energy levels. Um, and ultimately, we have to validate these approximations, that uh, kind of modeling step, um, through uh, the, the comparison with experimental results. So, for example, in the case of, of the problem we treated where um, in a homework assignment where we looked at benzene, so you predict um, a number of energy levels, uh, using our, our theory of mole molecular orbitals, but then the ultimate test is, does this agree with the experimental data? And not just does it agree, but of course, does it agree to within a certain precision that you're interested in? Uh, if you want higher precision, maybe it's necessary to go back to this modeling step and to not reduce the full set of uh, the full space of states um, as much as, uh, as you did. Okay, now one difficult part of that or one um, one set of operators that will introduce difficulties here are the position and momentum operators so um, later on we'll introduce position and momentum operators through their um, uh, th through their commutators and so the commutator of, of the position operator in one direction i um, or one coordinate i and the momentum operator in a coordinate j is i h bar times delta i j and then the um, identity operator now, we can see that this will break down if we uh, restrict ourselves to a finite dimensional, um, finite dimensional uh, Hilbert space. In particular, if we take the trace of both sides, the trace of a commutator will always be zero because it's the trace of xi pj um, is the same as the tra trace of pj xi, so that difference will be 
automatically zero. But the trace on the other side, where we have a product with the identity operator here, um, that will be equal to the dimensionality of the space we're in. So think about this identity operator on a two-dimensional um, on a, on a two-dimensional space of states that will return a trace of equal to two, equal to the dimension of the, the space that we're working in. And of course, um, those traces will have to be equal. So our assumption that we can do this in a finite dimensional um, Hilbert space breaks down. And so we'll have to go to an infinitely dimensional um, Hilbert space to actually make sense of these, uh, these operators. However, and as already shown, in uh, the case of the stern gerlach experiment, the, uh, the decoupling of those spatial degrees of freedom is sometimes possible so that we can just work with, for example, the spin degrees of freedom, which can be adequately represented in a, a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So again, what I wanted to point out here is that uh, even though um, there are definitely many cases where a finite, an infinite dimensional description is necessary, there are certainly just as, uh, as many interesting examples of cases where you can limit the Hilbert space to a finite number of dimensions and simplify the problem significantly using, uh, using that approximation. And then again, ultimately, um, the agreement with, um, with, with reality and with uh, the measurements will have to de determine whether this is an adequate um, approximation, approximation that you've applied. Okay, that was all I wanted to include before moving on to uh, the next topic.